thankful for the bounty you've given this country that we can eat and enjoy something like this. And we're thankful for the people that prepared this and the work and effort they went to. And we'd like to thank them and for all the work they've done for that. You know, we have these opportunities to come together and worship you to study your word. There's also these opportunities that are given to us every now and then. We can come together and just visit, talk, and become friends and learn more about each other and become closer to one another. I guess we call that fellowship to a certain extent. And we're just thankful for the opportunity we had to do that. We can get to know each other much better and understand and, and, and become closer. We uh, thank you for this congregation you've given us here. We come and worship, study your word, and the freedom we have in this country. Uh, we pray that for our leaders this nation, that they may govern with our good, with our welfare in mind, the welfare of all men. We pray that we may see a little bit of sanity and patience and caring and love in our government leaders rather than division and divisiveness we see nowadays. And may they work together to cooperate, rule over us for our best good. We pray that you'll be with the speaker this evening and he'll give a lesson that will be in accordance with your word and we'll have the attentiveness and be able to pay attention to it. Although sometimes that's difficult with five million games like this, Lord, but may we pay attention to that preacher this evening, to who's preaching this evening and learn something from this lesson and some way we can profit ourselves spiritually and in your eyes. In Jesus Christ's name, these things are asked. Amen. Six five seven. Next song six five seven. Yeah. 
to all of you who are weary and heavy laden after a meal like that. Hopefully you don't fall asleep. So, if you do have your Bibles open, let us look again at Colossians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 is where the majority of our lesson is going to come from this evening. Paul here, again, he says that Jesus, speaking of Jesus here, is the head of the church, head of the body, which is the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. And we're going to be looking at this word preeminence throughout the entire lesson. In verse 19, he says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So, Paul mentions four areas in which Christ is to be understood as preeminent. And we're going to look at all four of these areas this afternoon. So, first of all, Christ is preeminent in all things pertaining to the church. In the beginning part of verse 18, he says, and he is the head of the body, which Paul says is the church. So in the illustration, Paul is using the physical body to illustrate the spiritual body, which is the church, the spiritual body of Christ. Paul is teaching that Christ is the head of the group of people that make up the church. Christ is the preeminent one. Or the head and the thinker and the spokesman of the church. Each faithful Christian is a spiritual member of Christ's spiritual body. If you would, let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Keep your place there, or you can keep your place there if you'd like. Romans chapter 12 is where we're going to turn to next. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. 
Paul again is using the physical body here as a illustration. Verses 4 and 5 of chapter 12, he says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So again, he's using the physical body, body to illustrate the spiritual body and to illustrate the multiple number of members that make up both the physical and the spiritual body. Just as the physical body must have a head, and the head directs the body, in the same manner Christ is the head of the spiritual body, the church. Each local congregation learns what Christ, the head, the preeminent one, wants by keeping their minds freshly filled with the New Testament teaching, like we learned this morning. We have to study God's Word, the Bible, in order to know what we are to do as Christ, the head, commanded. Second, Christ is preeminent in all things pertaining to Christ being the beginning of all things. So let's look at this phrase, who is the beginning? This doesn't mean that Christ was the first one to be created, because he's not a created being. This statement emphasizes the preeminence of Christ related to Christ being the creator of the universe. The Greek word for beginning here is arche, and it means that which anything begins to be, or the origin, according to Thayer. Revelation chapter 13 and verse four, chapter 3, verse 14, tells us that Jesus declared to the church at Laodicea that he was the beginning or the first cause of all that God, the great designer, designed for to be created. So again, Christ was not created, but was rather the creator. Christ is eternal and was pre-existing before the universe was created. We might look at God's role in creation as the designer or the architect, and he drew up the plans, and Christ's role was the carpenter. He wasn't literally building with hammer and nails, but through the power of God's word, he created everything that God had designed. If you would, let's look at John chapter 1. Most of us know John chapter 1, but in context here, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, tells us about the roles of God and Christ. This is kind of a commentary on the creation. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Word is capitalized. And so, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the Creator in creation. God gave the command, Jesus did the creating. Like we talked about in class this morning, it's important that we must believe that Jesus is deity. Jesus is God. Now let's look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creation? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Again, verse 15, he is not the firstborn of every creature in that he was created, but rather he created them. So it tells us again that Christ is part of the creation. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 tells us that he was going to be a creator of something else. He was going to build his church. This relates to building God's spiritual 
creation. The word rock is used figuratively in reference to the bedrock foundation that Peter had declared in verse 16 when Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus was saying upon the bedrock foundation that uh, foundational truth that I am the Son of the living God, I will build my church. Remember, Peter is translated small pebble, so he wasn't talking about Peter himself, as some might think. Now, we're not going to turn to Acts chapter 2, but Christ built his church on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. This passage and many others in the Bible teach us that Christ is not only the beginning or the first cause of God the Father's physical creation, but that Christ is the beginning or first cause of his spiritual creation, the church. The church did not originate in the mind of man, but rather in the mind of God. The church was purchased by the blood of Jesus, Acts 20 and verse 28. So Christ began the church after he ascended to heaven, and about 3,000 souls heard, believed, repented, confessed, and were added to the church that day by God, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Christ made it possible for every sinful man and woman to be forgiven once they obeyed the gospel. Christ is the preeminent one in regard to the beginning of both physical and spiritual creation. God. Third, Christ is preeminent in all things pertaining to being, quote, the firstborn from the dead. This does not mean, or it does mean Christ was first to arise from the dead, never to die again. We do know that there were several that were raised from the dead. We have examples from the Old Testament and the New Testament. 1 Kings 17, 22, the son of the widow of Zarephath. 2 Kings 4, 35, the Shunammite widow's son. 1 Samuel 28, we have the witch of Endor, when God momentarily allowed her to raise Samuel up to speak to King Saul. We have Luke 7, verse 15, the son of the widow of Nain. And then, of course, John 1144, Lazarus, Lazarus was raised from the dead, but all of these would go back to the grave. Jesus was the only one that would never go back to the grave. If you would now, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20. Paul here writes, but now is Christ risen from the dead to become the first fruits of them that sleep, or that slept. First fruits here refers to one who would arise from the dead, but never die again. So Jesus' resurrection means that Jesus conquered every enemy and showed that he is Lord of all. He is preeminent. In other words, he conquered anything and everything that he needed to conquer. He is supreme and preeminent in all things. Fourth, Christ is preeminent because the fullness of God dwells in Christ. Verse 19 of our text, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. The word fullness refers to that of which Christ is filled. Christ is full of the divine characteristics of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Again, He is divine, and as Christians, we must believe that He is deity. Christ is eternal. Just like all the characteristics of the Godhead, Christ is omniscient. He is all-knowing, in other words. Christ is omnipotent, all-powerful. He is omnipresent, or all-present, all places at the same time. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. Paul writes, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
Here Paul uses the term Godhead again in reference to God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. This verse refers to the fullness of the Godhead bodily, referring to the fact that each of the three members of the Godhead are separate personalities and that all the divine characteristics dwell in each one of them, specifically mentioning Christ here. For in him, Christ, dwells all the fullness. So Christ has all of the characteristics. It was the Father's will that all the powers and attributes of God dwell in Jesus, his only begotten Son. These powers and attributes of God dwell in the Son, and these powers and attributes were not distributed to a multitude of angels, but to the Son only. So, if you are not a Christian this evening, your number one concern should be to obey God's plan of salvation, become a member of his church that he built. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Peter and the apostles are closing out the first gospel sermon that was preached, and this took place about 10 days after Jesus' ascension into heaven. And the closing words of this sermon, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made this Jesus, who, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter points out that they were guilty of sin, of insisting that Christ be crucified. The term Lord refers to Christ as being the master and ruler of one's life. In other words, the preeminent one of a person's life. Those listening were convinced that sin was in their life and they needed to do what was necessary for Christ to become the Lord and Master of their life. When they realized this, they were baptized. This evening, if you need to put Christ on in baptism, make him the master and ruler or preeminent one of your life, you can do that. If you are a Christian and you've fallen away, you can come back to him. Or if you just need the prayers of this church, whatever your need may be. We can help you as we stand and as we sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have Thank you. 
Christ's holy name that we 